process. Perhaps very pertinent to discussions around climate change finance are impositions not just of policy, but institutional arrangements for managing finance, which have caused a great deal of uh, capacity drainage from government systems rather than support for government systems. For example, requirements around public financial management, requirements around monitoring and evaluation that go right through government systems to the district level. Just one fact on that, and I, I, I heard yesterday from Tanzania, uh, health officials at the district level spend 25 days a quarter reporting to donors. Now, that's an enormous amount of time, so it's not just trivial uh, 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 what we're talking about here. Uh, just one point uh, uh, around uh, weak governance, and again, I think this is extremely important in, in relation to the climate change, uh, climate change finance debate. It's not an either-or situation when it comes to alignment. There are many different ways of aligning what's called shadow alignment, where capacities are still weak around public financial management. It's still possible to use the same time frame that a government uses for financial management processes, uh, linking in with budgeting and planning and the whole cycle in ways where you're not actually necessarily using systems, but you're aligning behind them and building capacity for eventual use of those systems. So uh, some brief points on some very major topics. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, look, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Salim to provide us a wrap-up, unless any of the panelists had any burning points. Please, quick. Just one quick uh, comment on the uh, agriculture insurance that was brought up, and I think that's a very interesting topic and, and very apropos for climate change adaptation. There's a, when I was in AD, at ADB last week for Water Week, it was brought up, and there's a seed company that offers uh, the weather index risk insurance as part of the purchase price of the seed. So you buy the seed, and they give you the insurance on the, on the crop. So it's, uh, that's an area where the private sector can move in very effectively, and it goes right to the heart of the increasing risks uh, associated with climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, an, an innovative example. Uh, okay, well, then I really would like to, to thank uh, all of you for this debate, and I would like to, to handle for the last word a, a very quick wrap-up to Salim. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Gabor. By way of wrap-up, what I want to do is to very quickly share with you um, something that is happening in the climate change arena which may be of relevance to the development arena. We've heard about learning lessons from development. There may well be some lessons from the climate change arena. And I'm specifically talking about a new fund that was created under the Kyoto Protocol called the Adaptation Fund. It's innovative in several senses. Firstly, there's no donor money here. The money there is a levy. It's called the Adaptation Levy on a transaction called the Clean Development Mechanism, which allows countries, Annex I countries under the Kyoto Protocol, to carry out mitigation projects in developing countries. These then get certified, and for every 100 certificates that they receive, two of them go into this fund called the Adaptation Fund. So it's a, an innovative way of raising money. It's already raised in the order of several hundred million. It may reach a billion dollars uh, fairly soon. The second innovation about the Adaptation Fund is its governance. It is the first international fund where developing countries have a majority on the board. Not just equal representation, but a majority. This is based on representation of the UN regions. So there are two representatives from all the five, each of the five regions, that's 10. There's two representatives from the Annex One, two from Annex Non-Annex 1 is 14. There's a special seat for the least developed countries as a group of vulnerable countries, a special seat for the small island states as a vulnerable countries group. That's a representation of the world, and it gives the developing countries a majority on that board, the Adaptation Fund board, 16-member board with 16 alternates. No other international fund has that majority built into its governance. And the third innovation is how it's going to deliver the funds to the countries. There are no intermediaries. Countries can get direct access. And they have to do that by presenting an entity, the national entity that they wish to be the one considered to receive the funds. That entity has to prove its capacity, so there is a level of the board has some oversight as to its fiduciary capabilities. But once it's approved, the national government can put forward their proposals to the fund. The fund can give the money directly to the national government. 
no intermediaries, no World Bank, no UNDP, no UNEP. Countries can use these organizations if they want, but they don't have to. So, you know, the development assistance field can also learn from the climate change field. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, this is the choices. Just for information uh, that uh, Salim will provide the wrap-up in the closing plenary session this afternoon, starting at, at 4 o'clock. And the good news that the lunch is ready in the, in the ground floor. So, with this note, I just would like to ask you to put our hands together for panelists and also for the excellent questions and discussions. Thank you so much for participating so actively. And enjoy your lunch.